Good evening. I'm Nicole Carroll. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of USA Today. Thank you for joining us this evening. Tonight, we're going to discuss effective strategies for changing history and fighting white supremacy. This event is part of USA Today's Seven Days of 1961 Project, a multimedia series spotlighting seven pivotal protests that fueled the civil rights movement and helped end legal segregation. The project includes many personal stories from civil rights veterans, an augmented reality experience spotlighting the Freedom Rides, a podcast series, videos, and more. Please plan to spend some time with it if you haven't already. We are thrilled to be able to share it all with you. Now I'd like to introduce Deborah Berry, a USA Today national correspondent who covers voting rights, race, and other issues. Deborah helped conceive this project. Thank you, Deborah. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. This project comes more than a year after the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and many other black Americans. It also comes amidst the national debate over systemic racism, over, over how we teach and what we teach our children, over voter suppression and all those other kinds of issues, important issues, particularly in the black community. What we wanna do here is give you a sense of what the civil rights veterans did in the past and what some of the civil rights leaders are working on now. Thank you again for joining us and, and so excited about this important conversation. What we want to do though also is to pay homage to the mass meetings of the 1960s. It was then that you, as you well know, that they opened with song and testimony as part of their effort to in, in inspire activists to go work, fight for freedom. And with that, we're going to start with the Morgan State University Choral Ensemble. Thank you. Let's see. 
That was beautiful. Thank you so much to the staff and the choir at Morgan State. Appreciate that. Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about our moderator and our dynamic panelists. Our moderator is Aaron Bryant, and he's a curator at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. Prior to the Smithsonian, he was a curator at Morgan State University at the James E. Lewis Museum of Art in Maryland. Another panelist is Representative James E. Clyburn, who is the majority whip and the third ranking Democrat in the, in the House of Representatives. He's also the highest ranking African American in Congress. He served as chairman of the Congressional Black Caucus and chair of the House Democratic Caucus. And in a personal note, he also represents my people's hometown in Sumter, South Carolina. Um, Erika Bennett is the executive director of the Youth Civic Engagement Organization, Mississippi Votes. She is experienced in youth civic engagement and leadership development, community development, and public policy advocacy. Our other guest is Mr. Cortland Cox, who served as the executive committee, served on the executive committee of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, also known as SNCC, which was a pivotal organization during the movement and is now. He helped organize the historic 1963 March on Washington, and he helped organize the 1964 Freedom Summer in Mississippi. Latasha Brown is a co-founder of Black Voters Matter Fund and Black Voters Matter Capacity Building Institute. She is also the founder of a regional network called the Southern Black Girls and Women's Consortium. We also have joining us is Dr. Nyambi Carter. She's Associate Professor of Political Science at Howard University right here in DC. Her expertise is in racial and ethnic politics in the United States with a particular focus on black communities. She is the author of the award-winning American While Black, African Americans, Immigration, and the Limits of Citizenship. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we're excited about this important conversation. Thank you, Aaron. Yeah, thank you so much, Deborah, and uh, thank you all for being a part of this uh, uh, program this evening. I'm really excited, and I guess I just want to start off with, and we'll just put it out there to everyone. Um, as we think about what we're experiencing today, um, I'm just wondering, how would you articulate what some of the most pressing issues are for you um, that, that really confront uh, communities across the country? And I guess we could start with you, uh, Congressman Clyburn. Oh, yeah, yeah, it looks like we might be having some technical difficulties. We'll get that worked out for you. But uh, Portland, I, I think um, this is another question for you, but I was thinking about it more in the context of when you were working in the 1960s, um, how do you compare where we were then and where we are today um, in terms of some of the issues we're confronting? I think the situation in today is very similar to the ones that we faced in 1961. Uh, what we faced was a group of people who felt that we were not fully American citizens and that we, in fact, should not be given the rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And I think the, the, the issues manifest themselves differently. In the 1960s, 61, it was the sit-ins, it was the freedom rides, it was the lack of the right to vote, 
and so forth. Today is question of voter suppression, voter nullification, and issues around the question of housing, question of police, uh, well, I guess police, I would use the word brutality. So I think the question of full citizenship is still the issue on the table for the black community. Well, you know, that's interesting because, you know, like, would we define citizenship differently today than we might have, say, 50 years ago? Um, Latasha, what do you think about that? You know, I think, I, I agree. Thank you for having me. You know, I do think that citizenship is under attack, but I don't think that it's ever been um, as simple as it's just about an attack on our citizenship. There's a full-fledged attack on our humanity. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, what we're seeing is we're seeing like Ahmaud Aubrey, a man just jogging that is hunted down by vigilantes and shot like he's a dog. We've seen um, uh, experiences where voting rights, I think we have to recognize the larger context of what we're fighting up against. I think the larger context is that, that white supremacy that the, that has undergirding all of this, that there is a white patriarchy supremacy model that seeks to say that white men with wealth in this country should be treated with some immunity and they can do anything they want to do that. We saw that within the Rittenhouse. And so we have to really recognize what it is that we're fighting up against, up against structural racism, it shows itself up when we see in terms of police brutality and how and we when we see the criminal justice system and the over incarceration of of um, disproportionate of people of color. We're looking at where there's an economic disparities when we saw that in COVID nineteen that all of the job losses um, from last year that literally resulted um, there were commute there were women. It were women and women of color um, traditionally. And I think the third thing is when we're looking at how they've actually looked voting suppression as a point of suppressing our, our voice. And that's always been three strategies. It's always been a strategy to impact and marginalize access to the ballot. It's always been around creating a culture of fear. And it's always around how do you weaponize the administrative process? We have to remember that slavery at one point was legal. And so it's how do you legalize the evil, the necessary evil of what I think undermines our humanity. So we need to recognize that we're in a different moment, that it's not just around the attack around our voting rights and our personage, that we're seeing that communities of color are actually being attacked on multiple levels, which is why we have to uproot and have an analysis around how structural racism is shaping all of these systems and why it's important for us to actually move into policy and to change these particular systems. Well, you know, I was just thinking, those sound like really complex issues. And I was just wondering, how do we begin to address them, really? Uh, Arika, do, could you talk a bit about your work and how you, you're addressing some of these issues uh, we're facing today? Yeah, listen, there are so many issues. The cornerstone to our problems in America begin with white supremacy and heteropatriarchy. Latasha's right, our country isn't perfect and as we like to pretend she is. And that is as evident as ever in places like Mississippi where remnants of Jim Crow haunt our electoral processes and continue to disenfranchise black people, young people, poor people, women, LGBTQ folks, the list goes on. And so from poverty to unemployment, to healthcare, to our fractured justice system, all these issues feel pressing because they are connected. And in doing electoral work, it's very important that, you know, for us at Mississippi Votes, we're able to help folks connect the dots between civic participation and the issues that concern their existence. For instance, during Mississippi's 1890 Constitutional Convention, S.S. Calhoun, which was the president of the convention, says of the convention, and I quote, we've come here to exclude the Negro. Nothing short will answer. And he and his contemporaries proceed to leave their mark by instituting what we now know as felony disenfranchising crimes. That original list of crimes where it was thought that black folks would commit these crimes and if convicted, um, we pro be prohibited from voting for the rest of our lives. Well, today those nine original crimes are accompanied by 14 other crimes and those still disproportionately affect black folks. That is white supremacy at work. And so in the blackest state in the country where nearly 40% of our population are black folks and nearly 11% of Mississippi's voting age population has lost their right to vote, the highest percent in the nation, along with the third highest percentage of disenfranchised black folks, black folks in any state in America, that feels pressing 
driven because it's linked to everything that we care about, people being able to determine their futures at the ballot box because democracy, right? Noting again that everything we are concerned with is connected in some shape, form, or fashion to some piece of public policy or some election. And so for me, the truth becomes that the problems of Mississippi are the nation's problems and perhaps America is the civil rights issue. Well, you know, these these are really complicated issues. And I think about uh, even as we were dealing with some of these issues, not just during the 60s, but, you know, going all the way back to when African-Americans through the 13th Amendment, you know, we could um, actually claim rights to citizenship to some degree. Uh, while we can mobilize, I would imagine, on a community level, I'm just thinking about how do we impact on a federal level or nationally. And I guess, uh, Congressman Clyburn, um, maybe you could talk about this from that perspective and what you see as some really important issues that we have to deal with immediately. Well, thank you very much for the question. I uh, see very strongly uh, that we are, as um, uh, we heard uh, from Kamala Harris uh, so often during the campaign, that the country is at an inflection point. We have to make a decision as to whether or not uh, we are going to do what is necessary to preserve uh, the democracy uh, that we profess to want to be, or whether or not we are going to allow the country uh, to go the autocratic way. I'm afraid that we are at a point where the vast majority uh, of one party has given up on democracy and has decided uh, that autocracy uh, may be uh, the way to go uh, for the future. So I think uh, between now uh, and I do believe in the next election, uh, we are going uh, to really take a position uh, in this country that will determine whether or not uh, this democracy uh, will survive. Uh, and uh, it will require uh, that all of us get outside of our comfort zones. Uh, one of the big problems we have here uh, in the Congress is that everybody seems to be uh, seem to prefer their corner of the world. If you were to take the Democratic caucus that I'm a part of, we've got nine caucuses within the caucus. And the reason we have such a hard job getting bills passed, nobody wants to give up on their little corner of that caucus. Uh, and neither one of us got 200 and 18 votes, and that's what's required for the federal government to make its mark here in the House of Representatives. So I think that we're at a point where we are going to have to decide how much of my comfort I'm willing to give up uh, and whether or not that is something that's going to be done by all the elements. Uh, because as of now, uh, I think that the other party has evolved into a cult. It is no longer a political party. Well, you, you know, you talk about comfort, and I guess that leads us to talking more about solutions. What do we mean by comfort? And I guess what people are really uh, interested in knowing about, whether it's on an individual level or working within their communities, um, what does that mean and what are some solutions? And I really would like us to talk about solutions. So we've identified, say, attacks on humanity, attacks on citizenship, um, voting, and just general democracy is under attack. Um, and that's what I'm hearing. So with that understanding, what are some solutions we might consider for one or all of these things? Uh, Professor Carter, I, I think you might have some insight on this. Well, I mean, I think I would echo what my co-panelists said, and I think you have to think about institutions here. Institutions aren't made for rapid change. They actually militate against that. And it's not to suggest that you cannot seek change in institutions, but you have to recognize the limits of those things. So voting is one part of this, right? But voting alone 
um, will not get us everything we want. I think it has to be a both and proposition where you have voting as well as activists in the street, boots on the ground, because that's what it takes. And if you want federal responses, for example, in the ways that Representative Clyburn uh, talked about, but also as my fellow panelists talked about, you can't divorce that from what's happening at state and local context. Because if you care about the makeup of your Congress, then you have to care about who's in your state legislature, because that's where districts get redrawn every decade, right? And we can't think about, if I'm just sort of paraphrasing here, um, all of these different issues as being disparate or separate, because these mm -hmm. attacks and incursions on our civil rights are not a la carte. They're happening as part of a systematic attack. And so there has to be some notion that the civil rights that we care about are all connected because creep in one domain tends to have spillover effects for other domains. So right now we're talking about voting rights, abortion, education, health care, all of these things, and they're all interrelated. So the remedy that you seek is going to happen at multiple levels. If you care about education, then you have to think about sort of your local communities. You think about voting rights, you have to be thinking about the state and the federal level. You want that sort of affirmative um, protection from the federal level, but you also have to be thinking about your state level representatives. You have to be thinking about your governors because they're going to be really important to this process. So it has to really be a sort of every lever being pulled kind of process. And it can't just happen every four years. It has to happen at midterms, right? It, it is exhausting, right? I mean, in some ways, these institutions are built to exhaust and to tax you because they're primaries and generals. And then there are presidential elections and midterm elections. And all of that can be a lot for people to take in. But I also think one of the places where we can think about seeking some remedy is thinking about freedom schools, right? I mean, there are examples of these all across the country that are really important because what we lack in this country, I think right now is civic education and that's critical. I think that's why so many people get frustrated and walk away because they don't actually understand how this thing that we call the political system and politics functions. And that has to be on us. And of, unfortunately, we're asking activists and citizens to do the job that really these institutions should be investing in. I mean, when I graduated from high school in Maryland, you had to have civics. I don't know that that's a requirement anymore for a lot of people. So I think we need to think about civic education. I think we need to think again more critically about the marriage between activism and politics. And I thank people like Erica and, and, and Natasha for what they're doing. Um, because that is so critical of a connection, but it has to be a every lever kind of situation. It can't be an either or proposition. Thank you. Um, yeah, that sounds pretty solid. And as you were talking, I was actually thinking uh, a lot about you, Cortland, and um, thinking to myself, here we are in the 21st century, and um, I like to think that we're much more advanced now, but you were dealing with these kinds of issues during the 1960s. I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about some of the strategies um, that you all took under consideration or implemented during the 1960s and think about it more in the context of what lessons can we learn from that? Because it seems like we've regressed, even though you would think we would have evolved uh, a bit. You raised that with me? Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, I think the most important thing in the 1960s was that we had a daunting situation. I mean, really brutal situation, but we'd had a mindset which said we want our freedom. Mm -hmm. We want our freedom. So we had a mindset that said we want these things and we were prepared to do what was necessary in every area to get it done. And I think the, today, if we translate that today, the question is, is not more important than, than any particular policy, more important than any particular election, is the mindset that the Black community has about what it wants, what it's prepared to work for, what it's prepared to expend time and energy for. Because at the end of the day, that motion is going to make the determination about what happens. So I think the most important thing that happened in the 1960s is the statement, we want our freedom. And we were going to get our freedom. We built a culture around it. We built you know, various articles around it. We went to jail around it, jail no, with no bail around it. And so my sense is a determination in our community 
that we want these things and we will do what it takes to get there is what is necessary and what we can learn from the 1960s. You know, that's really interesting because as I think about the term freedom, and I think nowadays freedom means so many different things for people, right? And during the 1960s and, and earlier, I would say that um, there might have been sort of a, a ground on which everyone could stand on in terms of how they define freedom. But, you know, Erica, I know you're working, you're, you're working with younger people. And so their definitions of freedom can be very different, right? You know, then you could be a doctor, you could be a professor, you could be, you know, a member of Congress, but we were all fighting for the same thing to a, to a great degree. But today, freedom means something very different to people. Um, can you talk about that? Uh, because I think we need to all start speaking with the same language because it's important that we understand that this is really about freedom. And for some people, freedom may mean a car, a cell phone, and, you know, being able to, you know, buy your kids uh, holiday gifts. Where What Cortland is talking about is something very different, right? Yeah. Um, my name is pronounced Arika, y'all, but it's all right. <laughs> It's all right. But I, I think it's important to draw on, um, you know, we are leaning on and, and into the work that was done in the 60s by SNCC and are very um, gracious to be walking in the legacy of that. Right. And I don't think that is us defining freedom differently. It's us reimagining what those tools and what the steps are towards liberation and towards total freedom and reimagining systems that just don't work anymore. And what young people are saying at this point in our movement is that it's not just about having access to the ballot. It's about having access to uh, an economic condition that meets the material conditions of our everyday lives and our needs in the here and now. And it's about our children growing up in an America that they can be proud of. And it's about being clear about um, how we get to live and be and exist in our entire person, right? Like I, I often think about uh, what Natasha was, what Latasha was saying earlier about human dignity. A lot of times um, when we were talking about movement building in the sixties and as I talk to my elders, part of what had been missing or what had been, um, yeah, what had been missing was being able to hear young people clearly. And it's not that young people don't understand what you're saying or what and how you're moving. It's literally people are not talking to young people at all. And the audaciousness of SNCC is that same energy that lives in our movement right now and how we are redefining um, what's next and how we move in this country. Yeah, but, you know, that can be really difficult to do, particularly when you're thinking on a community level and then even on a national level. It's almost, uh, it, it's, it seems like such a daunting task. Um, Latasha, I, could you speak to that on a community level? And then, uh, Congressman, um, how do we start thinking about that kind of mobilization nationally? Uh, first year. So I want to say Arika is my leader. I 100% I, I agree with everything that she says. If I can... Um, that she just said, I want to amplify that. I think we also have to think, we have to shift the paradigm. And I think that oftentimes, even when I talk to folks, I'm a native of Selma, Alabama. And so there's this narrative that Black people were fighting for the right to vote. No, not quite. It wasn't just the right to vote. Black people were asserting their humanity. They were asserting that I am a human being and I have agency and I should be able to participate in a process where decisions are being made by me and my communities. And so that's a different kind. That's a value system that is rooted that's not saying that I don't matter because the, the vote is more important than me. But in fact, the vote affirms how important I am in, um, in this moment and in terms of um, my, my agency. And so I think it's really important what she raised, because I do think that we're in a different phase. Let's let's say the differences between 1961 and where we are right now. The bottom line is we are in a um, in a space right now that not just Mississippi, we're looking at Georgia. We're looking at Texas. We're looking at the browning of America. There's a major demographic shift that is happening in the country. What you're seeing is the growth, 100% of all the growth in the state of Georgia were communities of color. What you're seeing in Texas is now that the majority of, of young folks under the age of 21 are communities of color. 
And so you're seeing a younger, more diverse, more tolerant um, America. And so the question is, can the infrastructure that we didn't have any, we didn't have any um, real, real create um, uh, way to, to have input, we kind of inherited, right? The nature of how our, our relationship was in this country that we are radically reimagining. We have to re radically reimagine the criminal justice system. But we have to be honest about the whole police force was an outgrowth of and an evolution of, of slave patrols. And so it was specifically designed to manage and control black people, the movement and the freedom of movement of black people. Here we are now listening, looking at mass incarceration, what kind of economic impact that has on our community, what kind of emotional trauma that has on our community. You're literally, when we're looking at the disproportionate impact of, of how our people are in, uh, um, are in that system. And so I'm raising that because I think it's important for us to recognize that we can't expect justice in the system that was created to marginalize us the first place. So it is going to require us to use our power to actually build this kind of coalition that I think is going to be of, of, of white people in this country, of goodwill, of black folks, of Latinx folks, of indigenous people. There is a new political landscape that is being shaped in this country. And what we currently have does not support right plurism. It does not. And so I think what is going to be really important, even what we're saying, we have to, to see the same and think the same. That's not what I think the issue is. I think in this country, we have not grew a tolerance and a respect on how we can differ and share space. That how do we create systems that support pluralism, right? That is what our task is as we're going forward. If we want to have a more equitable and just system, we have to radically reimagine what the system. Oftentimes when I speak, I ask people the question, what would America look like without racism? What would her systems look like? We have to literally be asking ourselves that question because that's our task. We have to see ourselves as not just mere subjects or citizens of this nation. We have to actually see ourselves as innovators. We have to see ourselves as being the people, as founders of a new America, that we are on the dawn of a new nation forming and coming. America's relatively young. There's an opportunity. There's a major shift. We've not had the demographic shift ever in this country that we have now. And I think it's really important for us to take this moment to not just be responding to the white supremacy and those pieces. We have to respond to that, but we also have to take the time to reimagine and restructure and talk about structural racism and create systems that are going to lend themselves to the outcome and the results we want, which is a more equitable, more fair, more just, and more democratic society. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate that. I was wondering, though, is that possible, right? Uh, Cong Congressman Clyburn talks about where he's operating, how there can be maybe a bottleneck to a certain degree of certain things happening, uh, people protecting their own power. So perhaps uh, Congressman uh, Clyburn, maybe you could talk a bit more about what Latasha is, is talking about. It makes absolute sense, but then how do we get people who are actually making the laws to believe that and act on that? Well, I think the first thing we've got to do is recognize that uh, here in the House of Representatives, there are 435 people that make up the House. And each one of those people come uh, from an area that we call a congressional district that's roughly 700,000 people. Now, the 700,000 people that I represent in South Carolina are it's just totally different from 700,000 people uh, in, uh, say, Texas or Florida. In fact, they're different from 700,000 people in another part of South Carolina. So when you get here and you need 218 votes for anything to pass the House, the question then becomes, how do you get to that 218? I noticed that the, uh, that the term coalition is being used. Yes, that is what's required. And so anytime you form a coalition, it means you take in a little bit from each group. That also means that each group got to leave a little bit outside of the process. And I think that that's where we have uh, our real issue. All of us have roles to play. 
And we have to recognize that if we are going to move our communities forward, we are going to have to recognize that if you're in the Congress, you got a role to play. If you're in the state legislature, you got a different role to play. For instance, during uh, the first uh, uh, term of Barack Obama, we, uh, we elected Barack Obama president, but over the next uh, four years, we lost 1,000 legislative seats. Now, what came out of that? These new districts uh, that we are now calling gerrymandered districts because the legislature, for the most part, draw these districts. And we never, for some reason, we never saw how those things interacted. We didn't pay any attention to the legislature, focusing all attention on the Congress. And you look up and the legislature says, I got a new Congress for you. And that's what we've got. So uh, I just think that one of the things we've just got to do is begin to recognize the roles that we all have to play. And those roles are different uh, based upon whatever your your interest may be, uh, what may be your ability, uh, abilities that you bring to the process. And that is where we have a critical problem right now. Uh, we can't get uh, legislation passed up here uh, simply because we have great difficulty uh, getting people to recognize that when you are trying to build coalitions, you got to give up something in order to get something. So are you saying that um, much of the change and reimagining that we need to do stops at the legislative level? I'm just wondering then, um, Niambi, maybe you could talk about, it's, I'm wondering if it can come from the bottom up, right? And that used to be a thing we believed in, right? That you tell history from the bottom up, you represent from the bottom up. Um, could you talk a bit about that, Niambi, you know, this whole idea of what can individuals do? And even simple things, because I think when we talk to people about making change and civic engagement, a lot of times folks might think it means you got to organize a demonstration or you've got to mm -hmm. organize a petition. But I'm thinking there are simple things that people can do, you know, even as part of their everyday lives. And I'm wondering if we could talk about that or if that's even possible. Well, look, I mean, I think we have fetishized this notion, right, that America has always been invested in democracy and a robust, expansive democracy. And I think everything we're seeing now shows us quite the contrary. I mean, we started out this country where many people, right, half the population, white women couldn't vote. Then you exclude indigenous people, black folks, I mean, and others. So we pushed, right, to make America become what it was. It took a century right, from the end of enslavement till we get something that looks like a Voting Rights Act in 1965, and then not even 50 years later, that's effectively been gutted by the Supreme Court. So I think we have to have a real clear conversation about what democracy in this country has looked like. It has always been partial. It has always been exclusionary. I think we have an idea of what it can be. And I think if we listen to many of our communities, people have been telling us we've already known many of the things that we can do at local levels, for example, same day registrations and, um, you know, universal registration. Right. So that people don't have to go through those processes. There are many things that we know that we can do to make this government more responsive. I know. And I think ideally we imagine that citizens votes are an input and policy is an output. But it doesn't seem to be working that way for many of the reasons that Congressman Clyburn pointed out, where you have situations where representatives are picking their voters and not the other way around. And that's not the way that it's supposed to work. So, yes, there are basic things that people can do. Right. I mean, running for office in your local communities, I think, can be really effective. I mean, I live in the District of Columbia. We have, you know, ANCs, which are really important advisory commissions that people can be on and you can do that with relatively little um, 
little votes. I mean, you can be on commissions. There are those kinds of things. But the kind of radical big change that people want to see can't just sort of come from, you know, expectations that the citizens rally and rally and rally. At some level, we have to expect responsiveness from those people who allege to represent us. And I think it's a it's a a sort of shucking of responsibility, right? Or, or, or kicking the can down the road or, or, or passing the buck, right? To say, well, citizens have to, the citizens have to. People are showing up. People want to participate. People want to be included. And it's it should be the expectation that the people who are essentially there to be our representatives, who are hired, right, for their term to do their job. Um, but that's not what we have. So I think, um, you know, we have perhaps been a little seduced by the narrative of the civil rights movement where it's a grand moment and we ignore all of the really unsexy things. I'm sure my co-panelists who, who do the organizing work that happen to make those big movements possible. I think we also have to be real. There's a lot of failure when you're trying to seek change, right? Just because you organize doesn't mean you're going to win, mm -hmm. right? You're going to fail a lot. You're going to lose a lot. But I think the the emotional toll that this sort of moment is having, I think we cannot overlook that we keep telling people out organize the rules of the game. But if the rules keep changing, mm -hmm. it's a, it's meant to frustrate and exhaust. And people don't have endless wells of, of, of mental and emotional energies. And I think we have to be really honest about that. Um, and And people are always, I think, thinking about innovative and important ways that they can change. I mean, we saw what New York City just did allowing um, immigrant communities to take part in local elections. I think that's important. So I think the the responsibility can be on the citizens and citizens are showing up. We've had historic elections at the presidential level, right? We've had historic elections at the state level. But at some point we have to look back at the institutions and the people who are managing those institutions and say, now you have to do your job and your part. And I think right now they're getting away with doing the minimum. Yeah. You know, Aaron, there, there is one piece. I just want to just add just briefly around that. I'm so glad. Um, I'm, I'm so glad of the previous comments. I think there's a couple of things that we have to acknowledge. One, I think we don't need to create false equivalencies as if um, that we all have a sheep, uh, 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 we have to have an equal sharing of the pain. Black folks have disproportionately impact, been impacted and shared disproportionately amount of the pain. The bottom line is when is our relief to come? The bottom line mm -hmm. is when you look at all of the job losses, there were women primarily women of color from COVID-19. When you look at who was disproportionately even impacted by COVID, it has been the African-American community. When you look at who is carrying the brunt of the economic out, uh, out on fallout on our shoulders, it has been us. And then when we talk about voting rights, here it is where black voters were the engine, you know, yes. because of the work of, 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 of uh, Representative Clyburn, the work of so many others, right? That we paved the road, we paved the road to the White House, we gave the best possible circumstances to govern. And here I am as a black voter from the state of Georgia. And because I, and, and we delivered two Senate seats, I have less protection for my right to vote in the state of Georgia now than I did last year. And so when we're talking about the brunt of who is carrying the pain of what is happening, it has been us. And so I think it's important for us not to create a false equivalency. So that is just a matter of how much more we go give, how much more else do we have to give? I think that what we've seen is that disproportionately we've taken and re received the trauma and the pain of our experience in this nation. I think the second thing that is also important for us to do is that we're going to have to acknowledge that there are major structural problems because structural racism is embedded in every single system. It is not by accident. <laughs> disproportionately black people in that space. So I think part of part of what we're going to have to do is to, and, and the third piece I'll say, is really not to hide behind American exceptionalism. The truth of the matter is America as it is American, America as it is laid out in the Declaration of Independence has never been achieved. Mm -hmm. And so we still have work to do. And I just think that it's important for us to have an honest conversation around what we've achieved, but how much we have not achieved. And that it's not just a matter of going back to get what we had. We've never got the fullness of what has been promised to us in the Declaration of Independence in this nation. Yeah, thank you. And Arika, did you have something you wanted to add to that? 
I'm just echoing Latasha. I think uh, Angela Davis's words are clear to me when we talk about reimagining America and just like, the systems that we currently have don't work. And, it, and it's really clear that we cannot rely on governments as they are, no matter who is in power mm -hmm. at whatever particular moment to do the move to, to do the work that only mass movements can do. And so I think there's another idea that we um, were talking as we were talking about reimagining a question of is that possible? Well, nobody thought America in this context was That's possible right. either. And so we have to be creative about how we're thinking about and talking about democracy because at it's very, it's very small point. Democracy is just an idea. It is not yet to be actualized. Well, you know, we have, um, going back to Latasha's point, I think we've had, had uh, we have had successes, right? And, uh, you know, you mentioned Latasha, the work that uh, Congressman Clyburn and the part that he played, the role that he played in South Carolina, for example, and moving people to action. And again, I'm thinking of, um, you know, the work that you did as well, Cortland, during the 1960s, and even some of the work that you're doing today, how do you move people to action? Because the whole idea of holding people accountable, there still has to be a game plan for that as well. People have to be invested in the idea, first of all, but you have to move people to action in order for them to invest in the idea. So how do we get people to, to actually take action to hold people accountable? And how did you do it? Please. Uh, one of the things that we really have to understand at the end of the day, the real question is whose interest is going to prevail? That has been the question throughout history. Whose interest is going to prevail? And it seems to me at this point, we have to both understand what our interest is and organize around our interests to make sure that in the, and as Congressman Clyburn said, there are many aspects going on, many people having different interests, that we have to understand that in order for our interests to prevail, we have to organize to make it happen. Other people are not going to make, organize to make our interests happen. So if our interest is to be treated with humanity or treated as citizens or treated, you know, have part of the economic pie, or, or, or all the things, good health, uh, good jobs, all the things that we talk about, we have to define our interests, understand what they are, organize around it, and we determine that our interest has to prevail. Because at the end of the day, that is the only way we're gonna move forward. I mean, we have to be determined that our interests will prevail. But how do you get people to understand that they share the same interests? Um, I, I don't know. It's, it seems like, you know, to the earlier point during the 60s, we all understood, regardless of where you were on a socioeconomic scale, whatever you did for a living, you know, wherever, what part of the country you were from, we all had some sort of stake and, or shared some sort of interest. But I'm not so sure that's the case anymore. How do we convince people that we all have the I same? Mean, I mean, I think, you know, I, I think at the end of the day, whether we're talking about 1960 or you know 2022, people want to have a good house. They want to have a That's decent right. job. They want the kid, their kids to be that. able to succeed. They want to, to, to have an environment that is, is very good for their, their health. I mean, all the things that people want as human beings uh, haven't changed dramatically. I mean, you know, so my sense is that, I mean, we, what we have now, the big difference between now and 1960 is that we have more instruments to make a difference. And we have to realize that over the past 60 years, you know, Congressman Clyburn wasn't possible in 1960. You know, President Obama wasn't pres possible. You know, our ability to impact the national election in 1960 wasn't possible. We have all these instrumentalities now. So we now have to define, given what we want, how do we now use the instrumentalities that we have? That we need to stop thinking only about what they're doing to us. We need to think about what, what we will do for ourselves and what we will do to them. So we need to begin to be actors, not always being reactors. Mm, thank you for that. Uh, Congressman Clyburn, I understand uh, you have to leave 
uh, shortly. Uh, but before you leave, I was just wondering if the, if you had a last word you'd like to share with the audience. Well, thank you very much. I, uh, as you know, we've got the votes going on, uh, trying to raise the debt limit, uh, trying to uh, get a little censorship going. And so we're going to be voting late tonight. Let me just say this. I, uh, I often talk about um, the 1960s. Uh, when I first met John Lewis, uh, we were 19-year-old college students uh, back in 1960. First up at Shaw University in the spring of the year, and then later uh, down at Morehouse College uh, when we were charter members uh, of SNCC. Um, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. I tell people that they have to remember that John Lewis, uh, within a year after the Edmund Pettus Bridge, John was kicked out of SNCC. Uh, John even left Atlanta, Georgia, or went up to New York for a year before he came back. Uh, and it's all because uh, we people fail to really recognize that all of us have roles to play. And they may not be the same. Um, uh, I stayed married to the same woman for 58 years. And it was not because I got my way for 58 years and know that she get her way for 58 years. We had to learn how uh, to recognize and respect each other and get the roles right. And I think that that is what is uh, really causing some tremendous problems today. We, you know, I have a tremendous respect for Black Lives Matter uh, and I support as much as I possibly can. But if I'm trying to get a piece of legislation passed, uh, I've got to know uh, that I've got to reconcile my experience and interest with that of somebody who may be totally different, but I need to get their vote in order to get the 218. That's what's going on in the Senate right now, uh, and um, we've got to get these three voting rights bills passed, and we cannot going to get any help from the other party. And we've got two people in our party that we've got to bring uh, to this vote. Uh, and the question is, how do you do that? How do you do that? Uh, and I would hope uh, that the way this country is divided at the moment, 50-50 in the Senate, we only got a full vote margin on my side in the House. How do we get these things reconciled and get the bills passed that we need to get passed and get the kinds of freedoms that we want to pass on to our children and grandchildren, this is going to be very, very difficult. And we're not going to do it unless we really are willing to give up a little bit of our comfort and hope that we can get the other person on the other side to give up a little bit of theirs and see can we find some common ground. That's going to be very difficult over the next 12 months. And I hope uh, that we can really weather the storm and get to where we need to be. Because I would hope that my children and grandchildren uh, will really uh, benefit uh, from what we're doing now and not look back and call us um, failures for having not done what needs to be done. Well, thank you, sir. We appreciate your joining us this evening, and uh, good luck uh, later on tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All righty. So, uh, Cortland, we still have you on screen here. While we have you on screen, <laughs> I wanted to talk to you about, um, the, you know, this whole idea of giving up comfort. So what uh, you and other panelists have talked about, and I think um, Arika was the first to talk about this idea of freedom, and then, you know, Latasha talked about this idea of freedom. I, do you think perhaps what Congressman Clyburn is talking about is something different? Um, because it almost sounds like he's talking more about compromise in terms of negotiating legislation. Um, did you see that kind of compromise in your experience 
um, and, and working for SNCC, and even today as you work um, for civil rights and social justice. Yeah, I, mean, I, I think there are two different discussions. The first is the broad base about organizing, mobilizing, and having definition of what you want to happen. Uh, and, and those things are, are, are going to be very broad and dynamic. The situation that Congressman Clyburn is in, in the Congress, and specific legislation and specific things around that, you're always going to have to have compromise and discussion because people, as he said, and I, I agree, is that different people have different interests. Even people who you totally disagree with, you know, they have their interests. And the question then becomes, are you prepared to go to war? Or are you prepared to work in a way that is incremental in terms of getting where you want to be? I mean, but the only way that Congressman Clyburn and anybody else who from the African-American community can be of, of importance and have some strength is that in the, the, in, the, in the communities across America, the black community is organized, the black community is strong, and people understand that they're prepared to exercise their power. So basically you have equals in the discussion. You can't have a real serious discussion if you have unequals having a conversation. So the question for us at this point understanding all the issues that we have is how do we develop strength? How do we become strong economically, politically, culturally, uh, in every other way, spiritually? And how do we now exercise our will in the discussion? I mean, I think that's what we have to, to think about. Well, thank you. You know, it's, it's almost like hindsight, though, to a certain degree for people who are a, a bit older. And, um, you know, I'm thinking about Arika, for example, or Niambi, your, your, your teacher at Howard. Where do you see younger generations in this conversation now? I mean, the things that we're talking about, are they concerned with? Are these realities for them? Um, Niambi, you first, and then uh, Arika, if you could respond to your, your youth mobilization. Well, one thing I will say is great about working with young people is they are unburdened, right? To a certain extent, they have an appreciation for the past, but a very clear understanding of their future. And they are the people who are pushing us to rethink our institutions in what we call institutions and how we do these various things, right? Like just because we've always done something this way doesn't mean we should continue to do this way. And that's one of the things that young people teach me all the time is that we can think differently. We don't have to stick to this thing that never worked for us, quite frankly, in the first place. And I think, you know, as long as there are young people around, I'm always hopeful. Even though I don't have hope in a lot of things, I have hope in young people. And I think they are leading by example. And I think our kids said this earlier, Arika, excuse me, said this earlier, which is we have to listen to young people. And I think young people have um, lots of ideas that people tell them all the time, oh, you can't do that, that's impractical. It's only true if we confine ourselves to things as they are. And I think uh, to the earlier point that was made, America as an experiment has never been um, fully what it was intended to be or what was written on paper. And that didn't happen by happenstance. So I think we have this notion that it's just a slip in practice. That was done on purpose. And when you've purpose. decided that there are a group of people who are not fully human beings, who are not worthy of any respect, who are not worthy of dignity, then you get these outcomes and you get them over and over again. So as a friend always says, you know, history doesn't always repeat itself, but it always rhymes. So the fact that we find ourselves mm -hmm. in this moment yet again um, shouldn't surprise us because we have a country that has made it abundantly clear, right, that it does not see people that look like me or many of us or our Latinx or indigenous um, uh, friends and allies uh, as being fully citizens. They don't see us as being fully human. They don't see us as being worthy of respect. And I think there are so many reminders of that everywhere. But I think, again, when you're talking about young people and you're talking about the organizing and the efforts that they're putting forward, um, you know, they resist that dehumanization every day. And I think our our really exemplars of that agency 
um, and don't probably get enough credit for it, right? We think of them as sort of being self-absorbed and only caring about mm -hmm. their iPhones. And I think we rhapsodized the 1960s as if every black young person or black person was an activist. That wasn't true then either. Um, but these young people are doing the work. And so I think, you know, looking at them, looking to them as models and examples is being sort of open, right, to possibility and really stepping out um, kind of on faith in, in trying things that they've never seen, like a fully functioning democracy is something that I think we should all be encouraging and supporting. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Latasha, I know that you have to leave as well early. Uh, if there's one thing that you can leave us with, um, the floor is yours. I'd like you to. Who's well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on, hold on. You know, I wanted to sing that in the spirit of lifting up what people did in the 60s. And, it, you know, I think that's a period of time that is so misunderstood. You know, I think that the way that 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 oftentimes the story is framed, it's framed as if there was, you know, this thing that was greater meant more to us than our own lives. Right. That in some way we were willing to sacrifice our lives for this precious right to vote when in truth. And truth, we were literally fighting and asserting our humanity. And truth, we were really trying to create a space that we wanted just what everybody else wanted. We wanted a safe shelter. We wanted to get paid fairly for our wages. I mean, when we worked, we wanted our family to be self. We wanted to buy a house, right? Just the simple things. And I think we have to really have an analysis to be honest about not getting caught up in this American exceptionalism and not understanding the opportunity we have right now. So I think the opportunity we have to do is right now is to imagine that we have the numbers. There is a shifting political landscape. It is younger, it is browner, and we want to create something that is more inclusive and more and, and different. And so we can't literally, you can't negotiate with the devil because at the end of the day, what you're negotiating, right? And so I think it's just really important for us at this moment to recognize the power that we have collectively, that we radically reimagine and we build the kind of America, right, that we see and that we deserve. Those American revolution at the time, England was the most powerful superpower on the planet, right? But yes, they had a vision, they moved forward. So I think that we can't just respond to the vision, the limited vision of others because the founders of this nation vision was so limited, they couldn't even see my humanity or the humanity of these my, my co families I think we have to assert and create a new kind of vision of how we're going to move forward and that we've got to work like hell to one, back off and reduce the pain happening to us right now, but to create and replace and build new systems. Even the Declaration of Independence actually says that, that you should abolish or replace when those systems no longer serve the, the people. And I think we're at that point right now that we've got to create new systems so that we can actually have a new future going forward that is equitable and just. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Do you have a few more minutes? You don't have to leave right now. Or do you have to leave right now? No. I have to leave right now, but thank you so much. I'm very, very grateful for, for this panelist and all the wisdom and power and energy um, that they brought and a whole lot of history. Thank you so much, uh, Brother Cox. You have opened up the path for all of us. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Latasha. <laughs> so, so Arika, you know, um, I, I think uh, early on we talked about some of these same ideas, but I'm just wondering, you know, what are the challenges to that? And you're you're out there working, doing this kind of work uh, every single day. Um, what are the challenges you're facing with this? Yeah, can I start by ask, answering the first question about young people? Oh, sure. Yeah, I thought you might mix them together. Actually. Yeah, I'm gonna try to do that. Um, so. I wanted to name that young people understand their conditions, right? And young people are not lost and young people are intellectual. And we've got to stop talking about young people in their lives as an issue that they can't conceptualize. Um, and so when I think about the challenges that you know we're faced with in Mississippi, aside from like obvious racial barriers and um, you know historical voting barriers and historical um, racial disparities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? The challenge for us in our current movement is to do better in engaging young people and engaging community um, in a very real way. And for, to Latasha's point, and I think um, Professor Carter made this point about young people being very much about the now and urgent in their decision-making. And so knowing that young people are clear um, about their electoral power, it shows 
each and every election cycle as they continue to show out in record numbers that they know that the power is at the, is at the ballot, right, at the, at the ballot box. And so making sure that, you know, we put an end to student debt and we pass the Freedom to Act vote, John Lewis's uh, right, voting rights advancement vote, and eliminating the filibuster so that we can do that. Um, and making sure that we're protecting reproductive freedom, all of the things that young people are are talking about and caring for. And so I'm bringing up all of these issues because just because young people aren't, you know, talking to you about them, it isn't that we don't know these issues are front and center in our lives because everything about some parts of our lives feel very political right now. Mm -hmm. um, and it's always in our face. And what feels political is real life to young people and to people who live in the deep South for sure. Mm -hmm. what, are, what are some of those issues that have that you're that you're uh, alluding to yeah i'm thinking about you know we don't have online voter registration in mississippi mm -hmm. and i think some of the neighboring states around us have those and so you know you think about college students and when we go do voter registrations um you know mississippi votes um, has registered somewhat near 30,000 new voters. Imagine how many more voters we could register if we had this tool, um, particularly young people. They're looking at us like, girl, what are you doing? Um, pen and paper, the lack of the lack of that is absurd and outdated in this point in time. The voter rolls are riddled with inaccuracies. There's a complete disinvestment in the most, um, the most potential of, of our electorate right now. And so there is no civics education. The civics that folks receive come from organizations like ours. And so making making that more accessible and um, being very clear about how we're, you know, giving people access to health care and how we're talking about reproductive care and how we're talking about black people's lives in a place like Mississippi are all issues that are intertwined with one another that if you don't address one issue, mm -hmm. you're not addressing anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you mentioned civic uh, education. That sounds like something that people, no matter what community you're in across the country, somehow, whether it's a community center or it's a mm -hmm. small house of worship, you can create a program to engage people in understanding how things are supposed to be structured, what their agency is, what power they have, and to understand how the system works and how it's supposed to work. Um, yeah. Yes, sir. Yeah. Let me, on, on terms of youth, the thing about each generation, each young group of young people, they come and see a situation that they don't like and they ask why. They that That is the important, ingredient for change. They mm -hmm. ask why. And when people tell them about the status quo and why it can't be changed, they say, why not? Those two things are important to change. And young people beginning to always try to figure out how the world should be as they think it should be uh, is the energy behind movements on a continuing basis. So, you know, my sense is that, you know, while I understand that the struggle is going to be long term, uh, while I understand there are many layers to the struggle, while I understand that at the end of the day, the things that I want to see happen may not happen uh, in my lifetime, what I do understand is that each generation of young people will always move the needle forward. They'll always move the struggle forward because they always ask those two questions, why and why not? Mm -hmm. And so that gives me a great deal of hope in terms of the energy that's needed to make change. Um, yeah, I want to also say one other thing uh, about the demographic shifts in the United States. Uh, as we know, in the next 20 years, uh, America will be majority minority. Uh, and one of the things that we see, especially in terms of nullification, and especially in terms of a number of things on the political front, uh, is the, that realization. And the question then becomes, you know, how, you know, we who have had power all these years, how do we maintain power? I find it's also very interesting on the economic front, about three years ago, people will realize that every commercial you see 
is either an integrated couple or black people trying to sell something to you. And so uh, on the one hand, on the political environment, you know, the number of people who are in the political environment are trying to hold back the tide. And then on the business environment and the economic environment, people now see people of color as customers. And so over the past three or four years, you cannot turn the TV on without seeing us selling stuff to the nation. So because people understand who the customers are going to be going forward. So as we begin to think about America, uh, as we think about what we should be doing and what we could be doing, we also need to integrate, as was raised earlier, the, the whole question of the demographic shift that's going to be happening in the next 20 years. Yeah, thank you. And, um, and you know, you were young at one time too, Cortland. <laughs> hey, hey, let me tell you, that was a long time ago. No, no, but my view is, you know, I think, and for my view, to me, the question of being young is a mindset. Mm. It, because basically, always trying to think, there is a song about, I forgot the name of the group, uh, it's, a, it's a white group, right? And the, the, the title is Don't Stop Thinking About Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The thing that keeps you young is the ability to not stop thinking about tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Not thinking about yesterday, but thinking about tomorrow. Where would we want to go? What do we want to do? And how do we want to engage? I mean, and, you know, as, um, you know, I spend a lot of time with today's activists. Because, as I said, you know, it is their energy that's going to propel us forward. Mm -hmm. So, I, I mean, across the board, as you know, you know, I, I mean, whether we're trying to get them to, to, to deal with their history working with the museum or trying to get them to deal with COVID and, in, in, you know, working with them to deal with COVID or working with them in various political arenas, I mean, it's very, very important that we understand that thinking about tomorrow is the important dynamic of staying young. Yeah, thank mm -hmm. you for that. And uh, as you were talking, I mean, the reality is historically uh, change, particularly on the grassroots level, has always been instigated and driven by young people. Mm -hmm. Even the folks that we think historically were older, <laughs> exactly. were really young, they were extremely young. And then, mm -hmm. of course, we, you know, when you think about um, some of the names we brought up today, even John Lewis, how young they were, we just tend to think they were older mm -hmm. than we are even now because, you know, people are older. But um, just historically, young people have always driven grassroots levels. Absolutely. Uh, change from, mm -hmm. from the bottom up. And along those lines, we have a school like Howard University, for example, <laughs> that has a long and storied history of students leading social change. And not just in terms of demonstrations and protests, but also, you know, one of the earliest community health care kinds of, you know, those ideas where uh, university students are, are, are making change by going out to the communities and actually doing service. Um, along those lines, I'm coming back to you, Niambi. Uh, we just have a few more minutes. I want to give each of you, you know, the last word, whatever's on your mind, to say it, and we can start with you, Niambi. Well, I'll say this. Demographics are our destiny. And I think we have a notion in this country that all roads lead to progress and it's a straight line. But we know there are a lot of peaks and a whole lot of valleys. And I think we're in a valley right now. And we can assume there's always going to be another election. Representative Clyburn talked about it. Natasha talked about it. Arika talked about it. Mr. Cox talked about it. Right. That um, we have a choice to make. Um, and the choices we make today will determine our future. I also want us to be clear that, you know, when we talk about these politics, Black people have really been innovators in this country. When we talk about this project of America, Black people have really pushed America to become better than what it was and forced America to live up to its promise. However, impartial in some of what we see today is because of the groundwork that Black people uh, laid yesterday. And one of the things that we don't appreciate enough from my mind, is that these changes that are ushered in with these demographics came because of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. That's when we get changes to our immigration policy in this country. So we can't talk about where we are today if we don't recognize these sort of three important pieces of legislation between 1964 and 65. So I think we owe, um, this country owes a debt to Black people on so many levels. Um, and whatever we have, 
right now and with American democracy is largely owed to what black people do. And then just one last note is listen to, to young people and listen to black women. Mm -hmm. um, we've got a lot of things right about these electoral cycles and we have done our work, but we cannot be the saviors. We cannot keep putting our fingers in, 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 in staving back um, the tide. And so we need help here. And so I would just um, end with, with those sort of uh, pieces of ideas. Yes. Yeah, thank you. And I'm glad you mentioned women because in addition to young people, historically, mostly women have led social change on the grassroots levels. They were the people knocking on the doors and uh, bringing people out to meetings. And, um, mm -hmm. and that was all the way up from, you know, abolition all the way up to slavery. Uh, so women have always played a leadership role in organizing our communities. Uh, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, Arika, we're going to get you uh, your last word. And then Cortland, if you want to jump in, we'll get you next. Um, first, let me just say thank you for having me. Um, what's really special about this moment and about being in the position that I'm in is that I really get to sit and listen to young people in a really intimate way and, and I have their trust and that feels heavy sometimes, mm -hmm. but I feel like in in reimagining, because we've talked about reimagining so much tonight, and reimagining what's possible, that has to be a dialogue that consistently happens across movements. Mm -hmm. It has to be intergenerational, and we have to recognize that the genius that is, exists now does not, um, it, it isn't replacing what has existed before, it's just building on, it's a continuum. And so, Reimagining what's possible because this, what we currently have isn't working. Many of the systems that we currently operate in is just not just, it's not fair. And as we rethink and reimagine democracy, human dignity has to be at the core of how we address any of those issues. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we're the country who says that she's learning and trying to be better, we have to rid ourselves of our old habits of racism, bigotry and exclusion and be really dedicated to struggling towards real systemic change. And that means that we have to be unafraid and unapologetic in that reimagining and, and all mm -hmm. of the messiness that that will bring. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and Cortland, I, I have a different question for you. and I actually wanted to ask all of the guests this and um, with all of this, are you hopeful and yes. considering what you've seen? Well, first of all, the answer is yes. You know, Ms. Bennett, you know, I've, I've heard of, I mean, we've been on one of these before, but you know, I, before she, I met her, I've heard of her work. And I know in Mississippi, while it's mostly in Mississippi, you know, it says that in where she is, and the, the location she is, she's doing important work. That mm -hmm. makes me very hopeful. Mm -hmm. You know, Dr. Carter, I attended Howard University uh, a long time ago. <laughs> and, you know, a number of important things and important professors and important people, important students came out of that. So my sense is we have both the people and the institutions that are gonna make a difference. Even though, see, I, I, you know, even though it's not immediate, even though it doesn't happen tomorrow, even though it doesn't happen two years from now or three years from now, I know it's going to happen because of the people and the institutions that are, exist. So I, I'm very hopeful. And I know that probably over the next two or three years, uh, we will see a number of actions taken that will make a difference. I mean, they're not going to make the difference, they will make a difference. But, you know, as uh, Senator Dirksen used to say, if you make, you know, a number of differences, pretty soon you'll have change. So I, I'm very hopeful. And I, I'm, you know, I think the panelists who are on here tonight give me a great deal of hope. Oh, that was wonderful. Um, and I was going to ask you all the same thing, but I think <laughs> perhaps in addition to hopeful, you sound very determined. And sometimes that's more important than hope, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so, you have to think it's possible. You have to believe it's possible. Yeah. Well, thank you all. This has really been uh, engaging. And um, we really appreciate you coming out and 
sharing your insights and experiences uh, with us. I think we're all the better for it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, yeah. you. thank you all. And uh, thank you to USA Today and, of course, um, the National Museum of African American History and Culture for uh, bringing this partnership together. And uh, Deborah, if you wanted to close out, back to you. <laughs> thank you, Aaron. And thank you for those excellent questions. And thank you, panelists, for that powerful and insightful discussion. Really appreciate you coming. We're going to turn it, our attention over now to uh, Miss Evie Shockley. She's an award-winning poet whose writing includes The New Black and Semi-Automatic. Ms. Shockley, thank you for coming and thank you for sharing your work with us tonight. Thank you. It is a real pleasure to be here. Uh, difficult, but uh, wonderful to follow such an inspiring and um, really clear-eyed panel discussion about um, the issues that we are facing um, that um, bring these uh, these problems from our past into the present and really try to focus us on the solutions that we that we need to 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 move forward um, with this country. Um, the poem I want to share speaks to one of the issues that was touched upon um, several times in the conversation, uh, voting rights. And it is written, it was written last year uh, in 2020 on the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment, which of course gave women the right to vote. Um, my poem invites us to think about how that anniversary hits differently for Black women. Um, and we actually just touched upon the fact that Black women have been so central to the struggle that we've been talking about. Um, I think about Anna Julia Cooper saying that when and where um, I enter as a Black woman, um, then and there the, the whole Negro race, the, the whole of Black people enter with me. And with Black struggle at the forefront of so many of the struggles for civil rights in this country. I'm hoping that though this poem focuses on Black women, it speaks to the, um, the promise of a full inclusive democracy that, um, that we're all working towards. And I'd like to dedicate my reading of, of this poem to Latasha Brown and uh, Arika Bennett, whose work is in the tradition of the Black women this poem speaks about voting rights, women's voting rights at 100, but who's counting? Eeny, meeny, miny, mo. Catch a voter by her toe. If she hollers, then you know, you got yourself a real Jane Crow. One vote is an opinion with a quiet legal force, a barely audible beep in the local traffic, and just a plashless drop of mercury in the national thermometer. But a collectivity of votes, a flock of votes, a pride of votes, a murder of votes, can really make some noise. One vote begets another, if you make a habit of it. My mother started taking me to the polls with her when I was seven, small, thrilled to step in the booth, pull the drab curtain hush shut behind us and flip the levers beside each name she pointed to, the X's clicking into view. There, she called the shots. Rich gal, poor gal, hired girl, thief, teacher, journalist, vote your grief. One vote's as good as another. Still, in 1913, Illinois' gentle suffragists, hearing Southern women would resent spotting Mrs. Ida B. Wells amidst white marchers, gently kicked their sister to the curb. But when the march kicked off, Ida got right into formation as planned. The Tribune's photo showed her present and accounted for. One vote can be hard to keep an eye on, but several 
a colony of votes, can't scuttle away unnoticed so easily. My mother, veteran registrar for our majority black election district, once found, after much searching, two bags of ballots, a litter of votes, stuffed in a janitorial closet. One Mississippi, two Mississippis. One vote was all Fannie Lou Hamer wanted. In 1962, when her constitutional right was over 40 years old, she tried to register. All she got for her trouble was literacy tested, poll taxed, fired, evicted, and shot at. A year of grassroots activism nearly planted her Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party in the National Convention. One vote per eligible voter was all Stacey Abrams needed. She nearly won the Georgia governor's race in 2018, lost by 50,000, an unkindness of votes to the man whose job was purge maintaining the voter rolls. Days later, she rolled out plans for getting voters a fair fight. It's been two years and counting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Shockley. That was wonderful and right on time. Appreciate you, appreciate you and your work. I want to thank everyone for coming out tonight or thank you for participating and joining our conversation. I also want to take this opportunity to invite you to please go check out Seven Days of 1961 at USA Today's website. So that's Seven Days at, at, of 1961 at usatoday.com. Be sure to check out the augmented reality experience. Be sure to watch the videos. Be sure to listen to the podcast. Be sure to check out the stories and all these other components. We tried to give voice to the veterans of the movement, to their mission, and to their passion. Please take your time and go through our project. Again, thank you for coming, and happy holidays. Be well.